morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our wonderful speakers, chairs, and audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome to yet another edition of ACNS webinars with very, very interesting lectures. The speaker for the first session of today is our honored guest from India, Professor Basant Mishra. Professor Mishra is the head of Department of Surgery, Hinduja National Hospital and Medical Research Center, Mumbai. He's also the head of Division of Neurosurgery and Gamma Knife Radiosurgery and Director of Neurosurgery Residence Programs at the HNH Mumbai. He was the Assistant Secretary as well as the Secretary of the WFNS in the past and then later he was elected as the second Vice President representing the Continental Society, Asia Australia Society of Neurological Surgeons in 2017-19. to Currently he's serving his term as the first Vice President of the WFNS. He was the recipient of the prestigious B.C. Roy Award, which is the highest medical honor awarded to a doctor in India. And he was also recently honored by the prestigious Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Association of Neurological Surgeons recently, for which I would like to extend our heartiest congratulations to him on behalf of the ACNS and our president, Professor Yoko Katu. He is a noted speaker to various conferences and workshops conducted worldwide. And he's also a noted researcher who has contributed to several articles in neurosurgery journals and books. We are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker at our webinars. And today he'll be talking about my Microsurgery for complex aneurysms is here to stay. The speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest from China, Professor Hao Li Jun. Professor Li Jun is the chairman of Department of Neurosurgery, Shanghai Chongzhen Hospital, and Director of Neurosurgery, Institute of Shanghai. He was a previous visiting scholar to the Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School, and International Neuroscience Institute at Hanover. He is the chairman designate of the Chinese Medical Doctors Association of Trauma Surgeons and vice chairman of the Trauma Committee of Chinese Medical Association. He is also the chairman of the Shanghai Medical Doctors Association of Trauma Surgeons. We are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker at our webinars, and today he'll be talking about surgical management of skull base injury, concepts, and opinions. The chair for the first session of today is an honored guest and senior faculty who is an icon in cerebrovascular surgery, Professor Rokuya Tanikawa. Professor Tanikawa is the Executive Vice President and Director of Department of Neurosurgery at the Soap Center, Sapporo Shinkai Hospital, Sapporo, Japan. He is a very important member of the Japanese Neurosurgery Association. He is a noted scholar with several publications in various peer-reviewed journals. He is one of the most sought-after person for demonstration of bypass in workshops and conferences conducted all around the world and hence also rightly nicknamed as a super bypass. He is one of the most famous and fierce of proponents of open surgery for cerebral aneurysms and hence rightly deserves to be the chair for this webinar very important topic of Professor Basant Mishra. We are extremely thankful to him for agreeing to chair this session and also for lending his relentless support for the educational activities of the ACNS for more than one occasion. The chair for the second session of today is our honorable faculty from Japan, Professor Shoji Yokobori. Professor Yokobori is a professor, director and chair and in the Department of Emergency and Critical Care Medicine, Nippon Medical School, Graduate School of Medicine, Tokyo, Japan. He is also director of Japan Association of Acute Medicine. Professor Yokobori is an integral part of many national and international societies, <clears throat> is the recipient of the prestigious Pfizer Award for Japanese Association of Acute Medicine. We are extremely honored to have him today and thank you for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Hao Li Jun. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers, chairs, and the distinguished audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Boon Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And our special thanks to Professor Shubin for coming here. He is our main mentor from China and has arranged and WeChat broadcast as well as arranging the wonderful speaker, Professor Hao Lijun. Thank you very much, Professor Shubin. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this virtual podium to our first chair, Professor Rokuya Tanikawa. Uh, thank you, Raja. It's a, it's a great pleasure for me to chair the Professor uh, Basan Misra from uh, Mumbai. Uh, he will talk about the uh, microsurgery for uh, uh, intracranial aneurysms. Um, the still now the under development of the uh, uh, end vascular treatment, the microsurgery uh, for aneurysm is uh, very important. Uh, I'm very looking forward to, to hear his uh, um, micro neurosurgery. Thank you. Thank you for your invitation to chair the Professor Misra's lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, please, uh, Professor Basan, yeah. please start your lecture. Thank you, Professor Tanikawa. It's a pleasure to have you with us chairing the session. You are a distinguished uh, aneurysm surgeon. I, I, you are well known all over the world, and you are, as Dr. Raja rightly said, you were the super bypass surgeon. So it's a pleasure to have you with us and all the faculty and many thanks. I will share my screen. Many thanks, uh, Dr. Raja, and my many thanks to Professor Yoko Kato 
uh, the president of ACNS for inviting me. It's an honor and privilege to be uh, contributing to this education program, which is so, so much your people are doing it over the period of the pandemic. It has become a very, very important um, educational tool. So thank you for that, uh, Professor Tato. And uh, my association with ACNS has been from the very beginning, in fact, before the beginning. This is uh, uh, started with uh, the Young Neurosurgeons Meet with Professor Kano, actually organized in 1993, Nagoya. And this is the picture of the first meeting when we all were there. Uh, I was one of those young neurosurgeons that time. And these gentlemen there were the the backbones of the organization of ACNS, which happened sometime after that, uh, after two years of the Young Neurosurgeons meeting, the ACNS uh, birth took place, and these were the leaders for that ACNS. So I've been, I've been actually associated before the formation of ACNS, and I have also had the privilege to organize uh, the ACNS Congress in um, 2006 in Mumbai, uh, which was uh, very, very successful and was the first time we had the largest gathering of about 800 delegates, first time ever, uh, and was very, very successful and very, very highly appreciated meeting. And I'm very thankful to uh, Professor Kano, who has been one of our low role models, and Professor Kato has been a very good friend of mine. We are contemporaries and we have been fellow travelers to all over the globe, uh, communicating and exchanging ideas and learning from each other. So for this talk, um, I would talk on uh, the need for microsurgery, and I will mostly uh, uh, talk about complex androgen because as we know, uh, this journal article in Lancet in 2002, whether you like it or not, changed the paradigm of androgen treatment when they came out with this editorial coil, don't clip. So most, many, uh, many of the small secular androgen, common garden androgens do go for a major part of the world, go for endovascular treatment today, uh, especially if there is no financial constraints. And Western um, uh, uh, hemisphere, uh, except probably Japan, Japan is still doing a lot of uh, microsurgery. And advantage of Japan, the neurosurgeons do endovascular surgery. So that, that's, a, that's a big advantage there. But in many other parts of Europe and the US, especially in Europe, the majority of androgens are being treated by endovascular means. And definitely all these common garden, secular, small androgens are given the first preference of endovascular treatment. So I will talk mostly about the complex androgens. So what are these complex androgens? If they could have a complicated wall structure, they could have technically difficult access. Um, they can be something which is, uh, uh, one second, let me see what the time. So they, they could have blister androgens could be also complex involving arterial uh, trunks and branches in the androgens, androgens presenting with stroke, unusual but difficult to treat and the giant androgens. All the giant androgens are considered uh, uh, complex androgens. So is coiling really superior? There are four prospective randomized trials as of today of secular androgen. The ISAT, of course, all of us know. The one-year results were good, but not at five and 10 years. There was no difference except for deaths. Most important to realize for the young neurosurgeons that ISAT was a very selective population of androgen. They were taking only, considering only uh, common garden, small anterocirculation androgen. There are no giant androgen, there are no posterior circulation androgens, and the patients were in grade one and two. So this is not all the androgens. The BRAT, which was published 2019, the 10-year data, there was no difference at any time uh, between the two groups. Uh, Finnish data, there was no difference. And the Chinese study, there was no difference. So there is, there is really one prospective randomized trial of secular androgens, which suggested that the small secular androgens are better treated by endovascular means. And this is the BRAD data, which is published in 2019, general neurosurgery. As you can see, the crossover, one, more than one third patients were in endovascular arm, arm had to cross over to the microsurgical arm because they could not be such treated. The treated retreatment rate was much higher in the endovascular arm. The complete obliteration of the androgen, which is the goal of the treatment of androgens, is abysmally low of 22%. So I think 
there is no question that microsurgery is more definitive, there is more durable. The question is there is a higher morbidity. So if you can improve the morbidity, then you can reduce the morbidity, then probably the microsurgery would be the way to go. So I will go through some examples of different ways they present uh, aneurysms which present with hemorrhage, presenting with ischemia and presenting with mass effect. So the basics for aneurysm surgery still remains the same for most anterior circulation aneurysms and many upper basilar and posterior circulation aneurysms. The sylvian fissure opening is the key, as has been advised by Professor Yasargil many, many years ago. Wide opening reduces the retraction, that reduces the postoperative morbidity. And you uh, spare all the veins, avoid retraction. And one has to uh, learn the young neurosurgeon, the bypass technique, because that's going to stay. What well, doesn't matter how, how advanced it is, the microvascular anastomosis is going to stay. And in my practice, I do a lot of skull base approach. I have an interest in skull base surgery. I, I'm a skull base surgeon. But paradoxically, I do less skull base approaches for skull base tumor and more skull base approaches for complex and giant androgens and the posterior circulation androgens. Because the white lead tumors can give you space and you decompress, you get space. For aneurysms, every single millimeter extra space reduces the retraction of the brain and reduces the morbidity. So I do skull-based approaches for complex aneurysms, and that's not uncommon in my practice. So complicated wall structure, clipping after coiling. Now, this is a lady with multiple aneurysms which were coiled after subarachnoid hemorrhage from the right MCA aneurysm which had bled. Uh, and they coiled successfully, but uh, this uh, they recannulated after six months. And then they say she came to us. He had not bled again, but there was residual aneurysm which was growing, so we took it. Now, in a in an aneurysm like this, the coils, part of the coils are in different parts of the aneurysm. So these coils are at the neck. So the, the typical aneurysm clipping when you put a clip at the neck cannot be done. So you need to have the other strategy, like what we did in this. We did a fenestrated clip. So the clip blades were including the circulating aneurysms. And the androgen coils, which is partly covering the neck, was in the fenestration. But that's not the end of the story. After that, you need to see because once you have coil, then maybe multiple components in this. Seeing the normal vessel, this MCA bifurcation on the right side. Now you can see there is a circulating component here, which is still which is still still live. So we put a, a curved mini clip, titanium clip, through this. Uh, through the to the ring uh, so that we have a complete occlusion as you can see post-op dsa there now so also aneurysm which has been operated outside has a residual aneurysm also is a case of a complex aneurysm and this is an acom aneurysm this is the right side that's the left side this is the anterior and this is the posterior these are the clips from the previous operation outside now you see these are the perforators so we are defining it and uh, now we're seeing through the the A1, A2 right side, and you can see that in a second, you will see that is the residual androgen fundus, which is still uh, filling up in spite of the eclipse which had been put from before. So that was the circulating part, which is still intact. So what we do, we go from front here. Now I'll reduce the time. I'm, I'm dissecting out all the perforators and putting the cliff from front down to two mini clips there. And then we think that we have taken care of it. We see under the microscope, we can't see any more residual aneurysm there, but that is not enough. So now we are going to put the endoscope there. And you can see once you put the endoscope, which was not visible now on the microscope, this is from the before previous operation, and this is my clip now. You can see still there is some residual aneurysm, which can now I can advance the clip and take care of that. So the endoscope assistant does help in this kind of thing. Now, this is less and less we are doing it. This is a lady in her 70s who fell down in the bathroom from a subarachnoid hemorrhage from a basal trunk aneurysm. This will today probably go. This was about 15 years back, which I operated through a retro lab approach, uh, which would today probably would be better managed by endovascular means because the access is difficult and you need an extensive skull base approach for this. Uh, but we did this, and this was for a retrolab approach, and uh, we are defining the basal artery, both proximal and distal, uh, to have access for temporary clipping. Uh, and this is, uh, we are defining the basal, basal trunk there, and my, uh, we are trying to define the neck. 
and we put a proximal basilar trunk. We had a temporary clip. We have put it there and we put the retractor on the aneurysm. The aneurysm is pulsating. There's a large aneurysm. And then you see the, the space is very, very limited because we wanted to preserve the hearing. So we went for a retro lab approach, not a trans lab. Again, it's very common for this one clip doesn't take care of it. It's still pulsating after one clip. Uh, and many of these thick walled androgens, you need multiple clips. So if we have put two clips and now the androgen is killed. And we see the microvascular Doppler, there is no flow. We see the ICG. And so we take care of the androgen uh, with this uh, skull-based approach. Now, blister androgens are also can be classified as complex androgens. They produce massive hemorrhage. They're actually almost a pseudo androgen. They, they blow out of the artery. And uh, this is one such case where the first CT angios did not show an androgen, but there was this filling defect. So we are suspicious about that. They, and then you can see we did it within 24 hours. The next day we did a DSA and you can see the androgen has filled up there. And so we took care of this androgen, particular one was with Sun clip, but there are other ways we have done microsurgery for this. This is another patient, a young patient in his teens with multiple blisters and also a basal top. So we have already clipped the basal top, which had bled. And this is the PCOM, the right side, this is the ICA, that's the PCOM. You see the multiple, very, very red and thin walled blisters, multiple blisters. Now in a case like this, what we do, we crush the muscle. We put a little bit of um, the cotton there. So you make a construct of cotton, thin cotton layer and muscle and put it on the aneurysm and then clip over that and take a little bit of the normal wall of the artery so that it doesn't give way. Because these are almost, if you try to clip the conventional way, putting clips on the neck, uh, this will give you. There are also multiple blisters which were similarly treated and all the androgens were clipped in the same setting. You see that this was the PCOM and this is clipped there. And this was the blisters at the ICA bifurcation. These were also clipped. And he also had a basilar top, which was first clip, which had bled actually. Now, this cotton clip wrap, which you find useful in many of these androgens, this is a, another MCA, uh, multilobulated androgens. And so this is the MCA bifurcation. You can see that that's the, one of the one of the lobes. We clipped it, and, but there is almost like a blister, another one lobe. You'll see that. See this, see that this. So we put a little bit of cotton muscle construct and then put a mini clip over that to hold it uh, so that it does not give way. And that's that we have found it useful in many of these cases. And many of these cases, small, very tiny androgens, when you the one which has, may, might not have bled, can grow to bleed and that would be taken care of. And this is one of the ways we can do that. And this was done there. And then we do the ICG and check that everything is all right. And this is a very simple and effective method. One of the many lessons I have learned from Dr. Spetzler. Now, this is a technique, a Dulles technique, suction decompression technique. This is a superior hypophysial ICA aneurysm, uh, which had bled on the, on the left side. You can see there, we have opened the neck. We have had a temporary clamping of the ICA in the neck, and we have put temporary clip in the ICA and the large PCOM. And before we see so you are sucking it out, so it collapses so that we can, we can, co we can coagulate it and reduce the androgen so that we can put clips there. So this is uh, technique is useful, uh, but sometimes when the androgen fundus is stuck to the skull base, it does not collapse. So you have to open it up. I'll show you in another case, uh, but then again, multiple clips are necessary. Uh, uh, and then you need to be sure that there is uh, no residual androgen. As you can see, these are uh, temporary clips removed. You can see ICA is filling up and we see that intracorridor is okay. PC, uh, PCOM is okay, but you will see in a second, that there is, uh, sorry, there is residual androgen filling there, ICG. So the androgen, though we thought we clipped, we have gone through beyond it, that was still there. So we had to put back again the temporary clip, we opened it up because the, the androgen fundus part of was stuck to the skull base, so it won't collapse. So we have, in spite of the temporary clip, it is still bleeding because this, the, the uh, collaterals from ECA. Uh, so now we have coagulated that, and so we put more clips. And then we do the ICG, we see that everything is okay. And we are satisfied now to come out. We do fluorocin to see the smaller vessel, the perforators, I think is better seen with the fluorocin. And then of course, every complex androgen, we always do a, not only a CT angio, but the DSC to confirm with a complete occlusion. 
Similarly, the MCA, multi, large MCA, giant MCA androgens, uh, very often the branches come out from the androgens, not uncommon, so, but we do this multi-clipping techniques, um, which is something which is not, people are doing more and more bypasses, but we are quite familiar with this and this can take care of many of these androgens. This is another lady with a bilateral MCA androgen, the, the right one had a, a thrombosed and the circulating component which had bled, patient in grade five subarachnoid hemorrhage, and this we could take out with multiple clipping technique. And the patient over a period of time improved, remained hemiparetic on the left side, uh, but came back on a second sitting to take care of the androgen on the left side. So in two different sittings, we took care of that patient remains hemiparetic, but otherwise functional. Now, this is uh, another type of way of treating some of the androgens. This is an androgen where the, both the anterocorridal and the PCOM are incorporated the androgen, so the endovascular treatment could not be done. And this is where we do, a, the, the, again, the same civil, civilian anterocorridal the drilling. We do an inside dural the drilling uh, of the anterocorridal. I'll skip part of this uh, um, video for the sake of time. And then we got space to put temporary clips in the proximal to the IC, the aneurysm in the ICA, and then put multiple fenestrated clips with the clip blades vertical to the parent artery. Unlike the common garden uh, fenestrated clips, when we use, we use the blades parallel to the parent artery. But this is because the branches, the arteries, uh, the PCOM and corridor are coming out of the aneurysmal segment. So we are putting clips, fenestrated clips, vertical stacking, so that the, the uh, branches are between these clips and painted. So we go through quickly, and then I'll show you the end of it. Now you have put multiple fenestrated clips, a series of multiple fenestrated clips with clip blades parallel, and then we are doing a fluorescein angiogram to see the anterocorridal is intact, and we see the, all the perforators. We're checking that everything is okay, and then one... We put that, we put a little bit of cotton sliver and put some glue there um, and whatever is left can be taken care of. So these are the blades. You see the blades are perpendicular to the parent. Artery. So we call it the vertical stacking. This is not a, a very common way we treat it, but sometimes this is a very useful way to do it. Now, this is another patient which had unruptured distal IC and on the right side, that was again similar technique was used but you see the post-op dsa is showing there is some residual energy mind you this is an unruptured energy so we wanted to follow this up which is something we have learned from my endovascular colleague the 95 percent occlusion and so on microsurgery we always wanted to do a 100 percent occlusion but this is an unruptured androgen this has been taken care of this residual androgen so we followed it up what well, six months angiogram DSA, you can see almost now got obliterated. So some of these small androgens which are left, which is probably does not need immediate go back if it is an unruptured androgen. So the lesson learned, old fashioned clipping, a disappearing act can occlude most androgens. And these are some of the ways one can do a diagrammatic representation of various ways one can clip and take care of these androgens. And this is another case where, again, endovascular treatment failed. This is a pseudoandrogen with the gentleman in his 50s who had a road traffic accident and became blind on the right eye, hemiparetic on the left eye. And after one month of the trauma, he had multiple episodes of epistaxis. That is when he presented to us. And this was an androgen. This was pseudoandrogen from the cavernous carotid. And the aneurysm was presenting and bulging into this phenoid sinus. And this was bleeding. So this patient was still sick. So we asked our endovascular colleague to first have a go. They tried it, but after multiple attempts, they realized there is a fracture segment, which is at the wall of the atrial wall at the aneurysmal junction. So they were worried of putting a flow diverter. They thought the aneurysm will, the artery will just give way and they sent back to us. And that was a simple uh, treatment that you put a high flow radial artery bypass graft. But it's important to understand and remember while a giant ICA cavernous androgen, which is not ruptured, which is just producing a mass effect, can be taken care of by just taking, occluding the ICA in the neck and putting a bypass. For a post-traumatic pseudoandrogen, it is important to trap the artery both in the neck and in the intracranial, just proximal to the ophthalmic. Otherwise, it can still bleed. 
So this is what was done successfully. The patient, of course, remained blind, but his hemiparesis improved over a period of time uh, and became uh, okay. Now, this is another example where uh, and microsurgery has uh, taken care of this. This is a moya moya disease, which had a subarachnoid hemorrhage from a, a aneurysm from the P1, P2 junction. And so this was clipped microsurgically and we did the STMC bypass at the same sitting. Uh, so both the things could be done at the same sitting and that probably was the better way to go rather than doing an endovascular treatment. And unusually patients androgens can present with ischemia. And this is one such example, a lady again in her 70s who presented with a left MCA infarct. Our neurologist evaluated it's a very small, very distal MCA, it's M4 androgen. You can see there with partially thrombus inside. And this is what we opened it up with temp under the temporary clip. One branch is still uh, circulating the artery and we remove the clot and what we call the inside to we sutured back with tenno sutures uh, to achieve the patency. She of course had a infarct already, but at least she over a period of time, she recovered uh, to be functional. This is another gentleman in her 60s, heavily thrombosed, is very small circulating component, again presented with a left MCA territory infarct. And this is the androgen at microsurgery. You can see heavily thrombosed, calcified, big androgen. I don't think there is any endovascular means to treat this, and that was treated with, uh, with excision of the androgen and the bypass. Now, presenting with mass effect is a major problem. Uh, and uh, today, in most uh, North American and European countries, the standard of care for a proximal ICA ophthalmic unruptured androgen is a flow diverter. And it's a good thing to do. And they do very well, actually, but not always true. This is one such example of an ophthalmic unruptured large androgen, which was appropriately treated by a flow diverter. Three months down the line, he presents to us with gross progression of visual deficit. You see the amount of edema there, the optic pathway is all edematous. And this is very difficult to treat that in spite of steroids and so on, the patient continued to lose his vision. So it's very, very difficult. This is one another patient of the ACOM androgens, which was treated with coils and flow diverter again, um, presented with a bitemporal hemianopia because of edema uh, after a few months of this uh, treatment. This is yet another patient of giant ophthalmic androgen, which was treated multiple started with uh, only a visual compromise on one side and finally landed up with right hemiplegia, androgen still free, free, uh, filling and the patient is still uh, vegetative or bedridden. So the flow diverter, while it's a good thing, is not without risk and not a panacea. So a patient like this, we presented to us, a, a young, a, a not uh, 50s, in lady in her 50s, a four centimeter androgen with, uh, with, uh, with visual compromise. We did a microsurgical treatment. But we, while we did that, we did the aneurysmography. We knew that the temporary uh, occlusion time will be long. So we did a protective bypass with STMC bypass first before we did that. And we took care of that. Now, any of these, all these giant androgens, we leave a little bit of redundancy at the neck, unlike the common garden sacular androgen, where we clip right snugly at the neck, at the, at the junction of the parent artery and the androgens. In the giant androgens, atherosclerometers, heavily thrombus, we leave a little bit of uh, neck of the androgen so that the parent artery does not get occluded. Now, this is another giant androgen, ICA, uh, proximal ICA. You can see that heavily thrombosed, only a small circulating component. And we, we took care, we excised that, we clipped it. And then, but at the end, when you did the ICG, you can see that there was this, uh, there was a uh, clot inside the ICA because of long temporary period of clamping. So we had to open the androgen, open the artery uh, through a, uh, after putting a bursting suture of 7O bursting sutures. And we, we open the androgen back bleed uh, so that with the thrombus can come out. We put temporary clip. Now we'll release the temporary clip uh, and this will back bleed so that the circulation can become all right. So it's not only the occluding the androgen. After that, the patency of the, the parent artery and the, all the branches are very, very critical. Uh, that so that you have a good outcome because it is important to reduce the morbidity if you can compete with the endovascular arm. 
Now, this is a young fellow in his teens who had presented with headaches and visual compromise, failed endovascular treatment, distal ICA inferior oral aneurysm, very thick walled, unruptured. Uh, and you can see that no clip would take there. So we have, we are holding, we are in spite of a temporary clip in the ICA, we are holding the, with a bayonet force at the neck so that the fenestrated clip, the classical way, the blades remaining parallel to the parent artery, first from proximal to distal, a series of clips, and then distal to proximal, another couple of clips, taking care that the anterocorridor and the branches are not compromised. But when you did the IC, we see that there is still some flow there, which we could not take care of because there was a risk of injuring the perforator. So we accepted that. And so this is what we started off with. And this is what we ended off with after microsurgery. But this was much easier for the endovascular colleagues to take care of. This is before the uh, third or fourth post-operative day in the hospital. You can see the slight the drift on the left side, which improved over a period of time. Now, this is a man in his 60s who presented to us all his vessels were diseased with progressive visual compromise, more on the right side. Now, you see the right ICA and heavily thrombus calcified uh, the anterior artery there, uh, fusiform, pan dolicocephalic, the left ICA territory, the posterior circulation, all were diseased. We are actually not sure how best to go about it because all the vessels were diseased. So we followed him up for some time till he forced us because he was losing vision on the right side. He forced us to do something. So what we did, uh, simple right uh, uh, high flow, right, uh, artery, uh, right radial artery bypass graft from ECA to M2. And we ligated the carotid at the neck. And this, we bought him some time. He vision uh, deterioration stabilized. But he's going to have tr trouble because all his vessels are diseased. But I think we given him some time. Now, this is a man uh, in his 40s with a CP angle tumor, actually, on a CT scan diagnosis was sent to us. Actually, as you know, it was a uh, completely circulating three centimeter uh, vertebral pica aneurysm. Uh, so we did a far lateral approach and we were exploring that. Um, you can see that we have good exposure. And then we are trying to find out the proximal vertebral artery and the distal vertebral artery first so that we can clip this a circulating aneurysm. Uh, and then, so we put temporary clips proximal uh, in the vertebral artery and distal in the vertebral artery. And then, so they isolate that segment and then we open up the androgen. Uh, you see that we, we suck it out with collapses like a cyst and then we dissect the wall of the androgen from the brainstem. And that's critical because the androgen would otherwise will not collapse even with clips. As you can see, after dissecting part of it, we, we are cutting it off and we thought we have occluded the androgen and we first take off the distal temporary clip. But there is still a lot of bleeding because part of the androgenal wall is still stuck to the brainstem. So you need to completely isolate it, release from the base, release from the skull base or release from the neural structure. More clips were put so that you can completely occlude the androgen. And then we take off the temporary clip. Critical to see that the, the pica is intact and uh, you can see that there, that's the pica there uh, under, uh, under the microscope and under the ICG, that's the vertebral, and that's the pica. So the pica is intact, the androgens were taken care of, and that's the post-op uh, CT angio. We have followed it of 10 years. After 10 years, uh, we every three, four years, he gets a DSA. Now he has had a recurrence, uh, and so he has been sent to endovascular treatment. So after 10 years of this treatment, uh, he had recurrence. They do recur, so one has to follow these patients. Now, this is a child, which a two and a half year old child who presented to us to altered sensorium, heavily thrombosed, calcified, a giant basilar top androgen. Uh, you can see that there, this is a circulating component, heavily calcified and thrombosed. Um, so this was uh, about 12 years back. So endovascular colleagues offered to treat this with coils. They put 17 coils, the androgen was taken care of. Uh, but unfortunately, over the next 48 hours, the child deteriorated very rapidly. Uh, we had first, sorry, we had first we did a shunt and the child became, became all right, almost asymptomatic after the shunt. And that's after that they put the coils. Now, after 48 hours of that, the child deteriorated and started extending extensor response, went into coma. We did the CT scan, the shunt was working, the ventricles were collapsed, but the, the, the mass of the, the androgen and the coils probably deteriorated the patient. So we did a, 
uh, we did a, a approach where it's a OZ approach and we excised part of the androgen, we decompressed the androgen and put clips there. Uh, and this, he had a very stormy post operative course, six weeks in the ICU, but five years, the child was going to school. He had ocular motility problem, mild hemiparesis, uh, and he had 11 year follow up. Uh, sorry, yes, there is a slide missing there, I think. Uh, okay, there's a slide missing there. Okay, so we have a linear follow up on this child now. Last year he came to us and he had the ocular motility problem. The aneurysm remains uh, uh, occluded and the brain stem is intact. And child, other than the ocular motility problem and mild hemiparesis, is intact. So, lessons learned coiling is not a good option in giant aneurysm. So, when we see a patient after that, the adult patient, almost a similar androgen, a thrombos, partially thrombos, partially circulating. Uh, we did an OZ, the similar thing, extradural anterior clinectomy, and did the intradural posterior clinoid drilling here to give that extra millimeter space. And it's a surprisingly easy androgen to clip because the androgen leg was, there was no clot, no thrombus. We didn't have to decompress. We didn't have to open it. And we put two large, multi-curved Yasser Gilead titanium clips. You can see that there. And then we see that the PCA, that the branch of the right PCA and branch and the clips in place. We did the ICG, the right PCA, right PCA branch and the opposite side. And of course, we need to do the uh, immediate post-op CT and you and DSA, uh, complete occlusion, all vessels are intact. And this is the patient, uh, uh, you can see there, uh, three months after the follow-up, uh, immediate post-op, he had partial third nerve paresis, but completely over a period of time, he improved and he has no deficit whatsoever. So this is uh, another very interesting patient, a young man who presented with acute subdural hematoma in another unit in coma. He had a decompressive cranectomy and survived. Uh, then referred to us uh, uh, after this CT angio showed that the whole right ICA was diseased, which had ruptured and produced the subdural hematoma, which was taken care of by the decompressive cranectomy. This had bled. He also had an unruptured basal of aneurysm. So this is the patient came to us. At that time, we advised surgery, we wanted to excite the aneurysm by bypass. He ran away, not unusual in my country, till, till after one year, he came back with progressive hemiparesis and intractable headache. When we did, we excised the androgen through the middle fossa. Uh, we trapped the ICA in the neck and the, just proximal to the ophthalmic and put a high flow radial artery bypass graft from ECA to M2 and send this patient for endovascular treatment for the basal atop, which failed because the PCA was incorporated in that uh, androgen. So uh, we, we went in again and we did a transylvian antitemporal approach and uh, uh, we, we, we could successfully clip the, the uh, ICA again. The same thing, we did a, a clinectomy, anteroclinectomy, we did a intradural posterior clinectomy, and with a multi clipic technique. And this is the, you see the, the aneurysm there, uh, the basilar artery there. Uh, you, can, you will see that the PCOM ending it, that, that the PCA coming out of it, that the basilar trunk. And we're trying to see the contralateral side PCA, contralateral third nerve and we're defining the neck and uh, we put under temporary clip on the basal trunk so, and then put multiple clips. And then finally, we had to actually sacrifice the PCOM with a clip because it was still circulating. And at the end of the day, uh, after two stay surgery, you can see that we had the bypass. So uh, the, the trapping of the ICA in the neck and the ophthal pre ophthalmic and right high, high flow IP, IC, uh, right eye, uh, radial artery bypass graft, and then clipping of the uh, body base in the top. So, this is my last example. This is a, this is a child in her uh, just, just short of four years who had presented with a basal top androgen with hemorrhage from Bangladesh. He was sent to us, uh, altered sensorium. And the CT angio was not informative enough. We thought that the neck is okay, but when he did a 3D DSA, you can see all the branches are coming out from the androgen for the four branches of the basal top. So the only way we thought we can, we can do it was through a hypothermic cardiac arrest. And this was, I think, was about uh, eight, nine years back. We did it, uh, I'm trying to see it. it this was, 
Uh, no, this was uh, 11 years back, 2010, we operated. And this is the last time we have done a hypothermic cardiac arrest. We haven't done that after that. Uh, but the child survived. As I said, the child was already compromised. He was altered sensorium. He remains in uh, altered. He communicates with the parents. He opens his eyes, swallows, but that's about it. Um, so he has survived, but I don't know it is, what is the what quality of life. So this year we had just published our data of giant intracranial aneurysm treated by microsurgery. We had 134 patients with 147 aneurysms. Posterior circulation was 24. We had a good outcome in 77% of cases and an operative mortality of 4.5% of cases. Um, that's published this year. People who are young neurosurgeon interested can go through that article. Now, we still don't have answer in my armometrium for some of these androgens, serpentine, posterior circulation androgens. All types of treatments have failed, so we don't know what is the best way to go. We have a series of patients we just have observing, but many of these patients over a period of time deteriorate and die. So to conclude, I would say flow diverter is a good thing, but not a panacea. One has to individualize and old-fashioned clipping uh, can occlude most of the androgen. Of course, bypass is, but can take care of many of these things, but the clipping also can take care of the, uh, many of these androgens. So I think microsurgery is going to stay. Uh, and uh, technology and technique does help, and you need to, the young neurosurgeon need to go and practice the bypass. That's going to stay. You need to have perseverance, meticulous planning, obsessive compulsion, and you have to have optimism because we'll have to have uh, morbidity. And once in a while, when you have a prompt patient who, who is lost or we, we damage, we need to retreat, introspect, and meditate. And this is in the Ganges to understand whether we have done the right thing. Before I close, I would like uh, all my friends and colleagues to invite to the 8th World Federation of Skull Based Surgery meeting in Rio, which was supposed to be in 2020. The pandemic moved it to March 23rd to 27 in Brazil. Uh, where I'm the president of this, uh, this society, please do join us. And also our continental meeting, the next continental meeting, the 16th one is in Jerusalem between 6 to 8 September, 2022. Jerusalem, beautiful place. One must visit. If you have not gone, do join us there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Mistra. Yeah, uh, it was very impressive. Uh, the Professor Misra uh, made the explanation about the uh, important roles of the uh, uh, microsurgery for uh, simple aneurysm and uh, uh, very complex aneurysms, especially uh, he emphasized that uh, the direct clipping is very effective and uh, uh, application of the uh, uh, microsurgical uh, anastomosis bypasses are, are very helpful to help the patient. And uh, uh, additionally, uh, he talked about uh, uh, skull based approach to, to make the surgery easy and uh, effective. The, the, he talked about the uh, uh, most es essential procedures in a micro neurosurgery, not only uh, uh, aneurysm surgery, but also uh, uh, skull based surgery and others. Anyway, uh, uh, it was very uh, educational, uh, very uh, useful uh, experience and uh, uh, explanation of his uh, uh, su surgical techniques. Okay, uh, and that we have a uh, we have a two, two questions from audience. Uh, one, one, one question is, uh, do you use adenosine during surgery and uh, how often do you use it? Uh, I'm a big fan of adenosine. I've been using adenosine very, very often, very, very frequently. Um, and I like it. Uh, this gives uh, not more than about 15 to 20 seconds time, but then that time is enough for you to put patties at the uh, rupture site, if you have a rupture and that uh, can take care of it. We also, not only when it ruptures, we also um, give it for, uh, for very fragile uh, ruptured androgens when in acute cases we are doing just before clipping, we use it to soften the androgen, reduce the pressure in the androgen so that it doesn't give way when you're putting the clip. Uh, and um, 
so that has been very useful. We have used it uh, multiple times. I can't give you a count, but we have used it. Some cases we have used it uh, about seven, eight times before we have finalized, uh, you know, uh, accepted uh, what we wanted to achieve. So yes, uh, adenosine has been a big help. Uh, having said that, uh, this last this last week we have had a case, and this is the first time in last so many years where after the, we, of course, the one thing which uh, the young neurosurgeon who, who are doing it, your anesthetist must be informed, must be aware of that you're going to do it. Of course, they are going to give the injection. You need to have a defibrillator. You need to have a shock. And these are the disposable defibrillators, which we keep every case. We have, we never had to use it, but every single case we keep it because that has been theoretically, it has been, it has been described that you can have a arrest patient doesn't come back, come back. So you need to shock. So that has, that's a must. And some description of allergy has been told, which we have not had experienced except last week. One patient which an acute um, MCA, uh, large aneurysm, multilobulated, I was treating. And uh, before the clipping, it's an acute uh, the first or second day when we are doing it. Um, before doing the clip, I, gave the, uh, I asked the anesthetist to give the adenosine. And the, after the first dose, the patient had severe brass, uh, bronchospasm, severe bronchos. They just could not ventilate the patient. And this is the one case in maybe last 12 years I have, I have bought it, but we got it. And But fortunately, they, they gave amino, aminophylline and they, get, um, they gave uh, uh, anti-allergic drugs, they gave steroids, and the, child, uh, the patient reverted back. So we didn't damage the patient, but they did happen. Uh, so one has to, the anesthetist have to be aware of these are some of the problems can happen. But I think it's a very safe drug. I have used it very, very frequently. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a basically a very safe, safe agent to stop the, the heartbeat. Um, and uh, in, uh, in, in my opinion, that uh, after after the adenosine, the the hypothermia is not uh, is not so important nowadays. The before before adenosine, the that the hypothermia was a very uh, one one of the excellent procedure. How how do you think about it? Yes, I told at the last uh, hypothermic cardiac arrest we used in two thousand ten. I haven't done a hypothermic cardiac arrest. It's a it's a very labor intensive procedure. You need to have two uh, two groups of surgeons. Uh, you know the cardiac surgeons have to be there with you. Number one, number two, there are a lot of a lot of complications can set in. Number one. Mm -hmm. You know the rewarming time, the coagulopathies they develop there. Yeah. Uh, so and the timing of the 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 hypothermic arrest, uh, low flow. So it's it's become as you said rightly. I mean, with the advances of uh, the bypass techniques, the adenosine hypothermic cardiac arrest uh, it has become less and less. People are doing it. Though some people are still doing it. I have done it last eleven years. The other thing which I have not used, I, I don't know whether Professor Tanikawa has done it, this rapid ventricular pacing, which um, uh, Volker Scheifert from Germany yeah. has talked about. He's, he, he's very, very fond of this technique of uh, rapid ventricular pacing, uh, which I, ha I have no experience, personal experience, but uh, that's also, he says, is a good technique. But that's a, that's a elective thing because the patient has to be evaluated beforehand. So you can't do it for ruptured aneurysm. They usually use it for cold aneurysm, they have done it. So he has a large experience. I don't know, Professor Tanikawa, you have experience with rapid ventricular patient? Uh, no, I, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I, I don't. But my uh, some, some of my colleagues, uh, Japanese colleagues, uh, have a, a experience of ventricular uh, pacing, and uh, they say that it, it's very uh, effective. Uh, and in near future, I want to try it. Yeah. Okay, uh, anyway, thank you very much. Right, thank you. It was a thank wonderful you. lecture. Thank, okay, you, thank, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. It was indeed two day force. What a wonderful example of each of the wonderful bypasses and different techniques of clippings that you have shown us. One question that I would like to put across that uh, you, are, I, you don't seem a big fan of aneurysm dome coagulation. No, 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 no. I didn't show it because uh, they, 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 the, the coagulation is very, very important. We do it all the time. We do it. In fact, many, most of the time, I open it up also. After the aneurysm clipping, I open it up to see that I have killed the aneurysm. 
and do, especially the white neck, large aneurysms, especially in MCA, ICA bifurcation, MCA bifurcation. I always call it. I always did. That's the Yasser Gil, which has, he had taught us many, many years back. Uh, and uh, so it's a very useful technique. I use it. I mean, I haven't shown everything here, uh, but yes, no, no, no. I, I use it very often. Right. Thank you very much. We can invite Dr. Shubin. Uh, yeah, Basam, uh, Professor. Uh, yeah. Actually, the last part of your presentation is the most impressive to me. <laughs> uh, so, but it's uh, too fast, you know. The, 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 the basal, the giant basal uh, aneurysms are most difficult to, to clip. And uh, uh, the last uh, article you showed us is uh, just uh, published for describe this uh, the posterior circulation aneurysms. No, no, these were giant aneurysms. Giant all, this is a series of giant aneurysms. Not okay, posterior, okay. Not all posterior circulation. Okay. But I, I mean, these are these are very dramatic cases. So naturally, I'm showing those dramatic cases because you know, so, so that child which is about heavily thrombosed, calcified, and he came in coma to us, and then we did a shunt, and he was normal. So it was very difficult for me to decide that go in with a high risk case, and they did. This was 12 years back, so they did 17 coils, and then in 48 hours he was started uh, decelebrating and went into coma. I went on ventilator. So we had to, that was an emergency. But the next patient, an adult patient who came with um, pyramidal signs, cerebral signs, uh, very little bit of, um, you know, in, instability, more rather than anything else, again, unruptured. That one we electively went on. We did not ask our endovascular. We electively went on. And that was a surprisingly easy aneurysm. Once you had the exposure, we had an anterior We had a posterior clenectectomy. We have enough space. We did not have to open the aneurysm and we could clip it because the, the, the clot was all in the fundus. The neck was free of um, clot and that has been there now for how many years now? Eight years we have following up, no, no re recurrence, no regrowth. So once aneurysm is clipped from outside, the recurrence, especially the basilar top, ICA bifurcation, the recurrence rate in endovascular uh, uh, you know, treatment, I think is higher because of the hemodynamic uh, in a push of the um, our new techniques are of course coming, but if you put a clip, you killed it. Right. Thank you. We are joined by Professor Hidehite Kumura from Japan. Oh. Professor Kumura. Thank you. Thank you, Raja. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, hi, nice to you. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Basat. And uh, nice to see you here, Professor Rokuya Tanikawa. And we've been here. Yeah, long time no see. Thank you for inviting me again. So, uh, so very, very nice, excellent lecture. I was so enjoyed a lot. And uh, so I was so, so very impressed. Uh, so you treat the so huge giant aneurysm and successfully treat it with a good outcome. I was so surprised. Thank you for your lectures. Thank you. I, Thank you. Yeah. And I have two questions. So. My first question is in treating the, uh, you show the blood blister like aneurysm, you treat the uh, uh, so called clip and wrap treatment strategy here. You show the so excellent technique using a high flow bypass and trapping technique. So, in, in treating the uh, blood blister like aneurysm, as you know, that we should choose the high flow bypass and trapping strategy, maybe the most safe and most effective treatment strategy. So in, in, that, in the strat treatment strategy, we can uh, manage the interoperative rupture in case. So you if you have no, no, no preparation for the bypass, in such a case, in the interoperative rupture, we have no way to save the patient's life. So how, do you, how can you manage a patient in such a case? Yeah, um, no, yeah, no, no, you are right. You were right. There are there are many ways of skinning a cat. Uh, I, I know there are uh, many, many surgeons, people like you would be doing a bypass upfront uh, and trap. Uh, I would like to preserve the parent artery. I think the patient's normal parent artery, if I can take care of the art aneurysm with a little bit of the wall of the parent artery, as long as the artery is, is a carotid artery is a big artery, you know, you you take off a little bit of the wall, it doesn't compromise the patient's um, blood flow, doesn't compromise the patient. 
and we have in our series of patients. I mean, there 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 ways of doing. It. I have done a couple of patients where I have done a bypass, of course, mm -hmm. but um, majority of my patients I have done either by uh, clip wrap muscle technique or by soon clip. We have had uh, I think about three soon clip. There's a there's a ring clip, which is a very old clip, which is I, I it's very difficult to uh, buy it now. It's not available commercially. But we had a we had a stock of this soon clip, so we have used it. Uh, some of these patients, uh, yes, you are right. I mean, um, you are uh, hundred <laughs> percent uh, uh, bypass patency. You mm -hmm. should do it. My patency rate is not hundred percent, so I would rather uh, save the art. You know, we I, uh, I don't yes, sure. have a very high bypass uh, experience, like maybe uh, you people, Professor Tanikawa or Bin Shu. I mean, five thousand bypass. I don't have that kind of experience. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much. I, I, yes. Excuse me. I would like to confirm, to Professor Misra, uh, the case that you presented about the uh, the blood breast aneurysm. Uh, was that case rupture or unruptured? It, no, no. That, the, that the the rupture, was from, rupture was from basal atop. Rupture was basal atop. He had also yeah. a basal atop. Yeah. These were yeah, I, I understand. The, so the 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 aneurysm you you clipped with the, the a wrapping technique was a, was a unraptured. No no no. I, I I saw two. No no. We have a number of patients who have ruptured. I saw two. I saw the first one. You know, with a filling defect. The first day CT and you was negative. That was a ruptured end. Mm -hmm. And that also we treated. The, I didn't show that video, but that was also treated the same thing. The video I showed was the unruptured blister, blood blister, and yeah. yeah. So the the ruptured one was a basal top. Yes, basically at top. Okay. Along. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I understand. I Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's my co host, Liu Bun Seng. Okay. Thanks, Raja. Uh, thank you, Professor Mistra, for a very nice uh, presentation. I have two questions for you, Professor. Uh, firstly, uh, regarding the mobility, uh, uh, flow, flow after clipping, the distal flow after clipping. Do you think that uh, which one is more reliable for us to assess intraoperatively? Either we are using an ultrasound probe or flow meter, which are recently introduced in most cases, most study, or you think the ICG or SSEP changes are most reliable? My second question, Professor, uh, in terms of giant aneurysm where you do clipping, uh, sorry, trapping and the bypasses, uh, do you excise all the giant aneurysm? If you don't excise all, in what cases do you excise? What are the indications with that increase the mobility? Thank you, Professor. Okay, the flow meter is the best thing, and the fatty cervels, uh, you know, the flow uh, studies, uh, these are the best uh, techniques, I think, to my mind. The two monitoring shows different. These are two, I mean, this flow is flow. The, the blood flow monitoring is also a very sensitive thing uh, so that you can pick up this and that's two different that is one is a physiological thing and the one is the, the volume thing so these are two different things both are useful but from uh, from a uh, microvascular doppler uh, but actual flow study the flow meter is better definitely icg uh, can be fallacious the flow of the sodium fluorescein can give you fallacy uh, the flow uh, actual flow is the best thing that and of course along with monitoring both has both can be simultaneous and should be used simultaneously uh, regarding your second question, no, I don't excise all the, the giant energy. No, no, it never. I never do that. I have never done a full excision of a giant energy. Many times I decompress the aneurysm, uh, and if and especially if I have to put a clip and which cannot be done, like I showed an example, I had to open it. I can do. I, I need to do that. Once you occlude the aneurysm uh, permanently at the neck and the aneurysm occluded, you don't need to decompress the, all the aneurysm because that pressure the the morbidity is because of the the you know the pulsatile pressure. Once it goes, the aneurysm shrivels over a period of time. So it doesn't need to be done that. I, I don't think it's necessary. But to be reduced in the moment uh, or the uh, non all the circulating aneurysm, non non thrombosed aneurysms, which have a full circulating component. Once you put a clip, we open it up. If there is heavily clotted, heavily calcified, we only decompress a little bit, not completely out. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. New Jerling Vargas wants to ask a question. Yes. You are, un you are muted. Please unmute your mic. Thank you. So first, I want to say thank you to Professor Bassan for an amazing uh, lecture. It was very interesting. And then 
Professor Cantaro Watanabe from my hospital. Well, my professor, he would like to say something else about right. this great right. lecture. Right. What the you have any reason? Right. Hello. Hey. Hello, guys. Yeah. <laughs> What's going on? This? <laughs> nice to meet you, Thank Sam you. Cantaro Watanabe. <laughs> Thank you. I just sit by by next next to next to the new jury, so. <laughs> I, I had the lectures so and it's it's a good great lecture. So thank you very thank much. Thank you. For that. Thank you. I appreciate it. And also, so I did uh, several cases of the giant turn aneurysm, and also after calling aneurysm cases, it's uh, like a, it's a, always very very tough case, and it's all uh, yeah, it's very uh, complicated. So I know, it's, and also it's, it's I I I feel that it's it's the big giant aneurysm is a uh, it's not aneurysm. It's like a tumor. Yeah, it is. So it's it always is. that they're going to grow and then compress the brainstem, and then, then the patient has a symptom. So uh, it's a uh, it's yeah. These, are, these, these are difficult strategy. problems. Uh, yeah, these are difficult problems, and I think that's one important thing is to have centers of excellence and uh, centralize the treatment of these complex aneurysms because uh, these are elective cases. You know, giant most giant aneurysms can wait and be taken care of by people who have experience rather than everybody is treating it. Because these are difficult cases. There's no question about it. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think we'll wind this session up before we go on to the next session. May I kindly inquire if Professor Basant Mishra would be staying back for the second session? Uh, Dr. Raja, I am in part of another. I understood you. You said, told <laughs> me that. I'm moderating another skull base session with Thank Sam Alpefti, and uh, you know, so I am sorry, I'll have to go. Thank but you I very give, much. Thank you. Nice Thank, you. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, you know, you. today there's uh, 1,500 audience in the WeChat channel. Oh, thank you. Watch the uh, presentation. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Vincent. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Bye -bye. Thank you very much, Professor Shubin, for that information. We are indeed so indebted to you. Professor Tanikawa, I know it's late in Japan. Would you be staying back for the second lecture? Yeah, I'll be here. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that thank you, everybody. Now, thank you very much, everybody who has joined. It was a wonderful lecture, and we had a lot of learning today. For the second session, I would like to invite Professor Shoji Okoburi to say the introduction part. Hi, everyone, and uh, good evening. Um I'd like to thank everyone for coming today. And I really appreciate uh, Chair Yoko Kato to giving me a like this great opportunity. And uh, I'd like to take a moment to introduce myself. Um, my name is Shoji Kobori from Nippon Medical School. And uh, my uh, specialty is about the neurotrauma treatment. So uh, I really are uh, looking forward to hearing the, today's lecture from the doc professor. Here we are, we are pleased to uh, welcome Professor, so uh, could you start your presentation, please? Okay. Thank you, uh, please. Uh, dear Professor Kato, Professor Shibin, dear Professor Tanikawa, Professor Mitro, dear colleague from all over the world. Good evening, I'm uh, Hori Jun from Shanghai China Hospital. I'm going to talk about the surgical treatment of scar based injury, practice, and uh, opinions. The history of scar based traumatology can go back to middle 18th century. When Professor Bijalo from Harvard University recalled and uh, described the famous American Clover case, the first case of scar based injury. In 1980s, Professor Sami from Germany published two books, formally established the term of scar based traumatology. In the recent years, based on the professor of progress of technology, scar based traumatology has entered a new era, minimally invasive uh, neurosurgery. My team and I have been focused on the area of uh, for 20 years. In 2009, I report our experience on surgical treatment of uh, cranial nerve surgery at uh, WFNS. 
we established uh, the international scale based trauma and uh, minimal invasive neurosurgery conference. It has been successfully held for four centuries. More than 3,000 delegates from over 30 countries attended the meeting, which promoted the treatment of scabies trauma in China and even in the world. Scabies trauma mainly refer to the injury of cranial nerves, main blood vessels, and the important structure of brain stem. The location of the gum based trauma is uh, deep with uh, complex uh, anatomy, high mortality and uh, morbidity. It could be concluded as uh, invisible, unreachable, and uh, un uncontrollable. There is uh, no good experience to learn from. We conducted a series of scientific and clinical studies. Then I went to Germany to study the micro surgery of the skull base. And when I was in Harvard working, Harvard working on the endoscopic neurosurgery, I got a seven grants supported me to continue a serious study of surgical research. This project has promoted the innovation and the development of the scabies traumatology. Today, I'm gonna share with you five technical types of scabies injury. Clean nerve injury, vascular injury, cranial cervical junction injury, CSF leak, and the uh, foreign body of the skull base. Let's uh, first talk about uh, traumatic optic neuropathy. This is uh, the incident of and uh, disability rate of uh, traumatic neuropathy is uh, higher. How to repair the optic nerve injury is a hot and a difficult item in neurosurgery. We conduct a series of study on this topic and I will show you some illustrative cases. This patient is a male, 23 years old. He had a traffic accident one day before and lot of visual acuity in the right eye prior to surgery. The preoperative CT scan showed fracture on the middle and inferior wall of the optic canal. So we decided, we decided to do an endoscopic and nasal surgery to decompression of the optical canal. This is a transnasal, transesmoidal approach. We can see the bony groove of the optical canal and started to drilling with a diamond bit from proximal to distal, we need to use the eggshell technique, which means to drilling the bone as thin as possible, but I always leave that piece of bone on top of the nerve for the protecting. Continuous irrigation is also important to prevent any thermal damage to the nerve. Now we can see we are almost done except for a little remnant piece of a bone. For irrigation. Now we can see we are almost done except for a little remaining piece of bone. I'm gonna continue to drilling. 
the optical canal was completely decreased, and the patient had a light perception immediately after a surgery. This is another case, a uh, 14 years old young man. He had a surgery for decommission of a right optical canal three months ago in another hospital, but uh, had no improvement on his uh, viral acuity. So we performed a second uh, surgery. During surgery, we can see that uh, only the pro proximal part of the optical canal was uh, decompressed, and uh, it is uh, not enough. It's uh, only for here. We performed uh, the intradural and uh, epidural decompression of the optical nerve combined with a uh, suit particled uh, or factory trunk transplantation. We hope that uh, new stem cell from our factory trunk can help facilitate uh, the recovery of the optical nerve. This is uh, the intraoperative findings. We following the initial bone integration all the way to the digital until we get the annulus of the zin and had a clear view of the superior rectus muscle with uh, is a landmark for the complete decompression of the optical canal. This is the final view of the full lens decompression of the optical canal. The patient recovered well and had a light perception one month after surgery. Then let's uh, move to superior orbital fissure syndrome surgery. The surgical treatment of superior orbital fissure syndrome in our group involved from extended transzygomatic approach, tyranoid approach, transmacadikino approach, and transnasal, transmaxillar, transmullous muscle approach. It uh, promotes the e evolution of the scalpid trauma surgery. This is a typical case. The patient had a trauma three months before. Now suffering from the traumatic cerebral uh, orbital fissure syndrome on this left side. We perform an endoscopic surgery to cerebral orbital fissure decompression or my cardi keyhole is my cardi keyhole here. We can see very clearly the super orbital fissure. After precise the drilling and the drilling, there is some bleeding. The super wall of the SOF was uh, re removed. It's a drilling. It's removed the superior wall of the SOF. And we can see a very, very impression here. It has its impression. Put operative CT scan showed complete decompression of the superior orbital fissure. On three months follow-up, the AMBO movement and uh, had significantly improved. This is another case patient with right side cerebral orbital facial syndrome. We conducted the cerebral, cerebral orbital facial decompression or transoral, transmaxillary, trans Mueller's muscle approach. This is the foot case report worldwide.
That ball movement uh, significantly improved after surgery. This case was published uh, in the Journal of Craniometric Facial Surgery. The third part is the orbital apex surgery, orbital apex, uh, apex syndrome surgery. This is a uh, 35 years old female. The traffic accident caused left eye movement disorder with uh, decreased vision for more than three months. She was uh, diagnosed as left side orbital apex syndrome. The surgery was performed with a 3D exoscope. We did a full length decoration of optical nerve. We can see here very clear and uh, the, all of the landmarks. Annulus of zin, this uh, annual, uh, annulus of the zin and the superior rectus muscle, superior here is uh, superior, re, super, superior rectus muscle. Both the intradural and the epidural part of the optic nerve was exposed is here. The pedicled olfactory tract was released and transplanted. Here is here. Here is here. The pedicular olfactory trunk was re released and transplanted to the optic nerve. This is uh, the optical, optical video. We first uh, did superorbital orbital fissure decompression. Here, the bone is a little bit thick. We must be very patient, choose the proper the size of the jaw bit, and uh, finally remove the small but important piece of the bone. Here is a depression of the orbital fissure. Then we release the olfactory nerve for in the sealed particled olfactory tract transplantation. Then we study the extradural decompression of the optical canal from proximal to distal until we get the full length decompression of the optical nerve. With the help of the axon scope, axon scope, even the small detail in the surgical field could be clearly observed by the everyone in the operating room. Here is the epidural, here is the intradural. Uh, both uh, viral Acuity and uh, ambo movement was improved after surgery. It's for ambo movement. The left bureau acuity is improvement. Oh, it's okay. We always seek for completely decompression for the nerve. This principle could also be applied in the tumor surgery. This is a case of right side intraorbital meningioma. I can see preoperative MI showed that the optical nerve was wrapped by the tumor caused his symptom of viral decline. We used the above and the below technique, treating the tumor simultaneously with both microscope and endoscope. After removing the tumor, 
we can see 360 degree exposure of the optical nerve. We believe that this is critical for the functional recovery for this non-traumatic optic neuropathy. This is the optic nerve into into canal. The post-operative MRI show the completely removal of the tumor as well as complete decompression of the optical nerve. Both viral acuity and uh, eye, eye movement are improved after surgery. Uh, the fourth type of cranial nerve injury is maxillary nerve injury. This is a patient with the right maxill maxillofacial trauma. She suffered from right check hypersthesia and hypersthesia of right upper tooth. In the CT scan, we can see fracture near the maxillary nerve foramen. It's here. It's here. She was diagnosed with traumatic maxillary nerve injury. We performed an endoscopic surgery decompression of the maxillary nerve. Based on the preoperative surgical plan, we found the fracture easily and identified the maxillary nerve, also known as inferior orbital nerve. It's here, it's a fracture. At the end of the surgery, we can see the intraorbital nerve canal was fully decompression and the intraorbital nerve was transferred. The symptom can, was relieved immediately after surgery. It's intraorbital nerve. Uh, intraorbital nerve canal is here. The latter type of coronary nerve injury is facial and uh, cochlear nerve injury. This is a, a young patient after facial nerve canal decompression. Her facial palsy was resolved immediately. It's a one day put operation. As we mentioned before, such surgical philosophy can also be applied in the surgery of the resecting acoustic neuroma. Acoustic neuroma. I can see we not only need to focus on the tumor, but also need to focus on the nerves. This is an endoscopic view of the internal or, or is the endoscopic view of the internal auditory canal is uh, internal auditory canal after resection the tumor. All the nerves are completely uh, decompression. It's uh, all the nerves in the internal auditory canal. This uh, technique leads to good functional outcome of both, uh, both hearing and uh, facial movement after a cortic neuroma surgery is of the patient. Scalp uh, is vascular injury are also common. It's partly traumatic aneurysm and uh, traumatic carotid cavernous fistula. This uh, patient is a multiple traumatic aneurysm from both ICA and uh, vertebral artery. Is ICA, this is vertebral artery, which were successfully treated by endovascular coil. This uh, annual case was uh, published in the ACTA Neurochidia. This is another typical case of the traumatic uh, carotid cavernous fistula. Treat, treated by the endovascular 
occlusion with the balloon. The third type of scalpid trauma is cranial vertebral junction injury. It is more complicated because it contains bone structure, bone structure injury, ligament, ligament tennis injury, and tactile member injury. This is a case of the identity. Uh, this is Odentoid fracture. We work with our orthopedic team to stabilize it with internal fixation. This preoperative is post operative. The next type of scar based trauma is cerebral spinal fluid run here. Or C at the I can see this could be treatment by both uh, open cranial surgery and uh, and nasal surgery. This patient, as we can see from CT scan, open surgery is the better operation for him. We use the open surgery after repairing the Fistula, he recovered very well. This is the CSF fistula. The last type of scalpis trauma is the foreign body. This is a three, two years old male, shot by the flying frag uh, fragment from an explosive high speed Grading wheel. This is a grading wheel. It's the pre-operating image. The foreign body was removed through infra uh, through uh, through infra temporal trans zygomatic uh, trans approach. Here is the abscesses. We can see it. Uh, Six centimeter long, the six centi uh, centimeter long. This uh, young man recovered very well uh, with no neurological deficit. This is another case, steel bar injury, penetrating the head and neck. This complicated case was treatment by the trauma MDT. We shared our experience on the old neurosurgery. As we discussed today, the scar based traumatology mainly include cranial nerve injury, scar based vascular injury, cranial cervical junction injury, and foreign body of a scar base. At the initial stage, we can only choose microscope it's, uh, for microscope. Then we had a neural endoscope. It is a great breakthrough. Nowadays, with the advance of technology, new device like a surgical robotic action scope make the surgery even more precise. The, they extended the surgeon's eyes and hands and make a functional reconstruction is possible. We now routinely use the action scope for scar based surgery. It is provide us excellent uh, intraoperative observing angles. This is uh, some uh, illustrative case. This one is uh, 
creeping uh, echo, echo aneurysm. Yes, here, aneurysm. And uh, this one is a giant complex uh, pica aneurysm with the uh, axon scope. It's a uh, pica. Uh, just as Professor Tisdale said, advances in surgery are leading to improve functional outcome and uh, reducing the risk. And we are always uh, on the way to pursuing better and better surgery. Because surgery is uh, not only the science technology, it is also art and uh, humanitarian. Uh, as a conclusion, scar-based trauma mainly include cranial nerve injury, traumatic uh, vascular injury, and uh, cranial vertebral junction injury. With the improvement uh, scar-based surgery and uh, image guide technique, surgical outcome of scar-based injury is uh, optimizing. With a low risk, Minimal invasive surgery of scar-based trauma is still the challenge for the for our neurosurgeon. And uh, we are going to have a first uh, international conference of scar-based trauma and uh, minimally invasive neurosurgeon in Changsha this uh, November. This will, this will also be streaming on the internet. We sincerely invite you to join us, both in Changsha and uh, online, to share the latest uh, update and uh, experience. Thank you for your attention. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lam Jim, for uh, uh, your great lecture with a uh, great summarized knowledge of the repair and uh, treatment of uh, uh, injury, uh, optic nerve injury or uh, uh, cranial nerves injury. So uh, yes, actually the, we have a less uh, little time of the uh, Q&A session. So uh, can I ask you some questions, OK? Yes, okay. Good, thank you. And actually, the, uh, you mentioned about the traumatic optic neuropathy, and uh, you choose a way of uh, transnasal uh, decompression surgery. So uh, I just wondered which should be a better for uh, transcranial or transnasal, and how do you choose the two different uh, way for uh, treatment? So uh, if you have a thought, please tell me. Okay. Uh, I say Chinese, okay, uh, for translating, okay. Okay. Uh, 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 Okay, uh, so we have two options uh, for the optic canal decompression mm -hmm. surgery. Uh, one is transnasal, uh, transesmoidal, and the other one is open cranial. So uh, um, we have to uh, concern about uh, the location and also the timing to choose the best way for the surgery. Uh, in, um, in seven days, uh, we have to do more of the surgery to do the surgery to the surgery. Because the surgery is more effective, more effective, and more effective. OK, if the injury uh, was within seven days, 
we would prefer transnasal uh, transesmoidal approach mm -hmm. because it might uh, provide a, a larger decompression uh, region and also uh, have a, a, a minimal invasive nature. Uh,因为时间长的手术，那么我们采取了一种经，呃，除了手术减压之外，那么我们还把修树的，呃，进行松紧，把它移植到视神经上，为它提供更多的修复机会。事实上，我们这样的手术，那么也取得了很好的治疗效果。uh, if the surgery was performed uh, later than seven days after injury, we prefer transcranial approach because uh, during the surgery, we would like to also release the, uh, the, the olfactory tract to mm. do a so-called inside to uh, pedicle olfactory tract transplantation. Mm -hmm. So we hope that uh, uh, the, the neural stem cells from the olfactory tract might help us to facilitate the functional recovery of the optical nerve. Uh, based on our preliminary findings, um, these results were very, um, uh, were very, uh, you know, aspiring. So uh, we are doing a larger uh, clinical trial, trying to uh, to confirm our findings. Okay, great. And uh, I I want to ask you one one more question. It's okay. And uh, you mentioned about the uh, uh, neural transplantation, but uh, I just wondered which timing of the transplantation should be a better for. Uh, uh, optic nerve uh, reconstruction. So, uh, if you have a uh, knowledge, please tell me. Uh, it's, a very, uh, it's a very good question. Uh,关于时间的问题，那么现在我们也在不断的探讨，不断的延长。我们最最初我们是做到呃十五天，然后做到一个月。目前我们最长的已经做到三个月。Okay. Uh, so the timing of surgery was a little bit controversial. Mm. Uh, there was no very um, uh, confirmed conclusion for this question. So for our ex from from our experience, uh, we first tried this surgery uh, within fifteen days after after injury, mm. and then we we extend this time to one month and recently we performed this surgery in some patients uh, three months after injury and we still can see some kind of improvement after surgery. Uh, because for these patients um, they uh, are willing to accept any kind of a treatment that might help them restore uh, their visual function. So uh, based on their requirements, uh, we, we, uh, we performed the surgery and it will help us uh, to evaluate whether we really could extend the time of surgery. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you so much for your asking. Uh, you were a great answer. And uh, okay, so uh, Professor Barugas, uh, yeah, you have a question? Please go ahead, please. Hi, thank you, Professor, for your uh, lecture. It was a very great lecture. And I have two questions for you. The first one is I would like to know. We know that the optic nerve is a very sensitive nerve and it's very easy to damage. Also in normal surgery, uh, program surgery, we can have damage. So in this kind of injuries, how is your experience about the nerve uh, 
after the surgery, how long the patient can start seeing again? Is possible the patient recuperate the vision of these kind of injuries? Good question. It's okay. It's a very, very good question. Uh, 根据我们的经验，那么呃，它的时间长短不一样，但是更多的是大概术后呃一个月左右，那么恢复的比较多一些，也有的通过减压能恢复的是会时间短一些。OK。OK. Okay. Okay, uh, so the timing uh, varies uh, among the patients. Uh, it depends on uh, how long. Uh, um, uh, 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 how much time it takes before the surgery was performed. And also, uh, according to our experiences, uh, most part of uh, patients uh, have some degrees of recover uh, after one month of surgery. It's okay? It's okay, thank you. Um, the second question is, uh, you mentioned about the CSF leak after uh, trauma. So when you do the reparation, you prefer to do endonasal approach. And what did you use for reparation the school base? You prefer suturing or you prefer to use package in the reparation? Okay, it's a uh, very good question. Uh, 颅底重建是这样 Okay, for the um, uh, acute phase case, uh, we would like to open the dura. So uh, we need a very firm uh, reconstruction of the skull base. So we would use both suture and packing. But for uh, patients with uh, a chronic CSF leak, uh, we would only use uh, packing. That is enough for uh, reconstructing the skull base. It's okay? It's okay, thank you very much. Right. I appreciate it. Thank you very okay. much, Professor. One question I would like to put across to you is that recovery from traumatic anosmia is only 10%. So how do you recommend or uh, hypothesize that uh, stem cells from the olfactory tract can actually restore the vision when it mm. alone cannot repair the olfactory and uh, I'm olfactory nerves due to trauma. What is your opinion? Oh, it's a very, very good question. Uh, 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 对时间的依赖性也是非常强的我们从图片中可以看到，那么我们的嗅神经是没有离断的，所以呢，它不会影响嗅觉，所以呢，这个手术那么呃会被患者所接受。谢谢。Uh, as we all know that 
uh, the optic nerve belongs to the uh, the, the central nervous system. There was no, and there was little Schwann cells. So a uh, simple decompression of the optic nerve uh, might not uh, help restore the visual function. So uh, we tried to use the uh, the olfactory tract transplantation. So as you can see that during the surgery, uh, we did not damage the olfactory nerve. It was only released and uh, translocated. So uh, the smell of patients after surgery uh, was not uh, influenced. And uh, according to our preliminary findings, uh, the visual uh, accuracy uh, did improved after surgery in some patients. But as you, uh, uh, as we all know that uh, some other factors also needs to be um, concerned, like the timing of surgery, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, the, the severity of damage. So all of these might uh, affect the surgical outcome. Right. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Yes, my co-host Liu Bun Seng. Thanks, Raja. Okay. Thanks for uh, uh, hello. Uh, thanks, Professor Hao, for a very nice presentation. Uh, Professor, I just wanted to find out from you. Uh, for optic nerve, you can see you can decide on the optic nerve compression by the narrowing of the optic canal. Uh, how about other nerve, for example, like maxillary nerve? How you know that it's due to compression or due to direct injury to the nerve? where you need to go in and do a decompression. Thank you, Professor. Oh, it's a very good question. Uh, 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 我们是能看到骨折的，所以呢，那么对这部分骨折的病人，我们要做减压。另外一部分，那么即使他骨折不是很明显，那么他因为在急性期他有水肿，我们的减压也是有效的。谢谢。呃， for the maxillary nerve injury, uh, most of the fractures could be easily found, uh, on the CT scan. Especially when we have some kind of a 3D reconstruction, um, and if we confirmed that the fracture compressed the nerve, so then we have indication for a decompressive surgery. Even if we cannot find very significant uh, fracture uh, uh, due to the edema caused by the injury, we can still do uh, the decompression surgery so that to restore. Um, the the function of the nerve is okay yeah, thank, you, thank, you, thank you very much i think it's time we can wind this up now we can take the concluding remarks from professor shoji yokobori please unmute sorry your yeah okay sorry about that. yeah thank you everyone thank you for uh, uh you are joining us today and uh, thank you professor uh Lejian for your great session. And uh, thank you for Professor Taniga for uh, doing the chair uh, in the uh, previous uh, lecture. So uh, yeah, actually today, so uh, we, we could have a great opportunity to uh, learn and teach together. And I hope uh, we can meet together again in the near future. Okay, uh, Raja, Professor yes, Raja. Thank you, thank you, yeah, thank you very I, much. I, okay, good, thank you. And uh, I take it over to you, okay? Thank you very much, Professor right. Tanikawa. Thank you very much for staying so late. We are indeed so much thankful to you. Professor Shubin is here with us. Professor Shubin, thank you very much for joining. Thank you, Raja. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Professor Hobichi and uh, Professor Tanikawa. Look forward. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We had great 
wonderful lecture today and a lot of learning. So I'll close this officially now on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato. I would like to sincerely thank both the speakers and chairs, Professor Basant Mishra, Professor Hao Lujun, Professor Rukuya Tanikawa, and Professor Shuji Okubari for their time and support for the educational initiatives of the ACNS. A special thanks to Professor Shubin for supporting our educational ventures and suggesting world-class speakers to us, as well as broadcasting these webinars in China. I, I, I understand there are more than 1,500 audiences who are viewing us live right now. Thank you very much all who joined. Special thanks to also my co-host Liu Bun Singh for joining in today. So until we all meet on next Wednesday, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.